with the consent of honorable the esteemed dignitaries on dais we may please proceed with the program honorable lordship mr justice suryakant judge supreme court of india honorable mrs justice sunita agrawal chief justice of high court of gujarat and patron in chief gujarat state judicial academy honorable mr justice nv anjaria senior most judge high court of gujarat and executive chairman gujarat state legal services authority honorable mr justice ashutosh shastri judge high court of gujarat and president gujarat state judicial academy honorable judges of high court of gujarat present in the audience my fellow judges from district judiciary including those on deputation in registry legal department the academy gujarat state legal services authority and elsewhere as also those watching the program live on youtube none amongst us is alien to writing judgments and yet i find that i find that penning up a decent judgment is a task in itself for one we have to ensure that judgment contains just the right mix of the following relevant facts the arguments the relevant laws analysis of facts and law applicable and thereby ensuring that the judgment is a speaking order and above all to keep a flow so that the reader does not get lost in rosy language or unnecessary quotations and most important to keep the judgment from being unnecessarily long prolong long <coughs> but then why am i indulging in these nitigrities we have honorable mr justice suryakant judge honorable supreme court to guide us through this labyrinth we are also very glad this is lordship has graciously accepted our invitation by sparing quality time to be amongst us this afternoon indeed we are all very eager to hear his lordship however first things first which is lighting of lamp ano bhadra kratvo yantu vishvatah this is a slok from rigved translated which means let noble thoughts come to me from all directions light ladies and gentlemen symbolizes knowledge and wisdom for which we also invoke the blessings of ma saraswati the deity of knowledge and wisdom on the other hand darkness signifies everything evil and bad and so as to dispel anything that is bad or ominous and to invoke knowledge and wisdom from all directions we shall call upon the dignitaries on dais honorable mr justice suryakant judge supreme court honorable mrs justice sunita agrawal chief justice of high court of gujarat and honorable mr justice nv anjaria senior most judge high court of gujarat to proceed for lighting of lamps After lighting of the lamp in this positive ambient atmosphere, it is time to extend a warm welcome to Honorable Justice Surya Kant, Judge, Honorable Supreme Court. I would thus request the Chief Justice, Honorable Mrs. Justice Sunita Agrawal, to deliver welcome speech befitting the occasion. a very good afternoon to everyone honorable
A very good afternoon to everyone. Honorable Mr. Justice Surikant, Judge Supreme Court of India, our esteemed Chief Guest, Justice N. V. Anjaria, Senior Judge, Gujarat High Court, my colleagues on the bench, Judicial Officers of the State of Gujarat, members of the Registry. Today, we have the distinct honor of welcoming a distinguished legal luminary where His Lordship has dedicated his life to the pursuit of justice. We gather here to extend a warm and heartfelt welcome to our esteemed Chief Guest, Honorable Mr. Justice Surikant, a jurist of exceptional distinction who graciously accepted my request to address us today. Born on February 10, 1962, in the historic city of Hisar, Justice Surikant has achieved a remarkable milestone by becoming the youngest Advocate General of the State of Haryana in July 2000. His Lordship earned the distinction of being elevated as a permanent judge of the State of Punjab and Haryana High Court in January 2004. Before his Lordship's illustrious appointment as a judge, in the Honorable Supreme Court of India in 2019, Honorable Mr. Justice Surikant served with great distinction as the Chief Justice in the esteemed High Court of State of Himachal Pradesh. His Lordship's tenure in this role led an indelible mark on the judicial system, guiding it towards greater excellence and equitable legal processes. His Lordship's journey in the legal domain stands as a testament to his exceptional legal acumen and unwavering dedication to the pursuit of justice. In legal fraternity, Honorable, the name of Honorable Mr. Justice Surikant resonates with the highest principles of justice, equity, and the rule of law. His Lordship's illustrious career and commitment to upholding the values that form the bedrock of our judicial system are a source of inspiration for us all. His Lordship's contributions to the legal landscape at the national level continues to be a guiding light for the entire legal fraternity. Today, we gather to understand the nuance of the art of judgment writing, a critical skill in the legal sphere. A well-crafted judgment serves as a judicial opinion that tells the story of the case, explains how the court arrived at its decision and provides the reasoning behind it. It is not just about delivering the verdict, but also making it reasonable, logical, and easily comprehensible to all the stakeholders, including the parties involved, the legal community, and the general public. A well-structured judgment typically comprises several key elements, such as introduction and caption, statement of material facts, identification of legal issues or questions, summary of arguments by both the parties, Application of relevant law and principles, deliberation leading to a conclusive verdict, clarity on the final relief granted to the parties. Judgment writing is an art and a science that reflects the judge's unique perspective and requires precision and logical reasoning. It is essential for the judgment to be clear both in terms of facts and law to minimize the burden on appellate courts to ensure that the parties involved fully understand the outcome and the reasons behind it. In the process of judgment writing, the judge's responsibility is not merely to deliver a decision, but also to provide a foundation of sound reasoning. The reasons are crucial for the legitimacy of the judicial process and serve as an incremental step in the consolidation and transformation of 
societal values to achieve excellence in judgment writing judges are encouraged to structure their judgments with clarity coherence and conscience using headlines subheading paragraph numbers enhance accessibility and readability additionally making judgments accessible to people with disabilities and eliminating inefficient practices like scanning documents can further enhance the quality of judgment writing hence judgment is a layered exercise encompassing both the immediate parties and the wider public it is a vital instrument for upholding the rule of law fostering social and transformation and consolidating the fundamental principles upon which a just society is built clarity simplicity and lucidity are the guiding principles for all the judges to ensure that their judgment judgments fulfill their critical role in the legal system now let us reflect on some of the landmark judgments which shows the re remarkable exemplary art of judgment writing of justice Shur surikant honorable mr justice surikant has delivered numerous judgments on various important aspects such as human rights gender justice various important topics such as of education prison reforms his lordship has been praised for his art of judgment writing which involves a skillful application of law and logic his lordship's judgment emphasizes emphasizes the importance of clarity precision and impact in judgments his judgments are also reflective of his lordship's emphatic empathical approach in the landmark judgment of ashish mishra versus state of up Justice Surikant, as part of the bench of the Supreme Court, granted interim bail for eight weeks on humanitarian grounds, while the investigation and trial in the case was still pending. The judgment recognized the right of victims to participate in the bail proceeding and to be heard at every stage of the criminal justice process. A significant development in victimology. the judgment also cautioned against irrelevant considerations or undue haste in deciding bail matters in n raghavendra versus state of ap justice honorable justice surikant authored the opinion of the bench that held that bank is not the trustee of the money that a customer deposits in a bank and the same is not held by the former on trust for him he explained the legal relationship between the customer and the bank and clarified the rights and liabilities of both parties his lordship also gave suggestions on how to improve the judgment writing skills and make them more clear precise and impactful these are only few examples of honorable mr justice surikant's judgments which reflect his impact on the society he has been praised for his art of judgment writing which involves a skillful application of law and logic presence of justice surikant honorable mr justice surikant here today signifies his lordship's unending zeal to make contributions to the legal field and his lordship's faith in the principles of justice equality and the rule of law we eagerly anticipate the valuable insights his lordship will share with us today and the lasting positive impact it will have on the legal community on behalf of all my colleagues and the judicial officers of the state of gujarat present here i extend our warmest welcome to honorable mr justice surikant judge supreme court of india we look forward to being inspired by his lordship's wisdom and to strengthen the bond of justice that his presence represents today thank you
Thank you, Honorable Leadership. And to further express our indebtedness to Honorable Mr. Justice Surya Khan Saab, as also to honor his Lordship's presence among, amidst us, we propose to offer a memento of Surya Mandir, Modera. Briefly, the temple is one of the few where Sun Lord is worshipped. It was built by King Bhimdev of the Solanki dynasty in the year 1026 AD and is situated on the banks of Pushpavati River in Modera, Mesana district, Gujarat. With this brief background, I humbly request Honorable the Chief Justice to please present memento to Honorable Mr. Justice Surya Khan. Next, we have a photo frame, Matajini Pachedi, roughly translated Matajini Chunar. This art, once in woe, is slowly fading and it appears that presently there is just one individual in Kutch, Mr. A. Gafur, who makes these beautiful frames. I would now humbly request Honorable Mr. Justice N. V. Anjaria to present the frame to Honorable Mr. Justice Surya Khan. And I would also request the staff to please open it before presenting to His Lordship. Ji. Sorry for the goof up, Lord Chip. We'll rehearse this the next time so that this doesn't happen next time. Next, Lord Chip, we'll proceed with the release of a coffee, book, a coffee table book, Strokes. Art, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the most candid ways of expression. Our heart swells with pride to inform your Lord Chip that under the able guidance of Honorable the Chief Justice, the Juvenile Justice Committee, High Court of Gujarat, comprising of Honorable Mr. Justice Biren Vaishnav, Honorable Ms. Justice Sangeeta Vishenji, and Honorable Ms. Justice Geeta Gopi, under the aegis of Gujarat State Legal Services Authority, had organized for a painting and drawing workshop that too on specific themes, Woman Empowerment, Nari to Narayani, Nari to Narayani, Hazards of Child Labor, Books Not Bricks, and Clean Environment. For the children of officers and employees of High Court of Gujarat, aged 6 to 16 years, 
those paintings and drawings have been compiled in a compact tafee, coffee table book titled Strokes. For the release of this coffee table book, alongside the dignitaries on the dais, I also request Honorable Juvenile Justice Committee members, Honorable Mr. Justice Biren Vaishnav, Honorable Mr. Ms. Justice Sangeeta Vishen, and Honorable Ms. Justice Geeta Gopi Madam to please come to the stage for release of this book, Strokes. One of the participants, Lordship, a specially abled child who had participated in this workshop. She is amongst us today. I would now switch to Gujarati to invite her over to stage. Hina Ben Jayeshwai Vagela ne vinanti karish ke teo stage par aavi. Coffee table book strokes te namdar Supreme Court Nyai Murthy Surya Khan Sahib ne prastut kare. And now, the moment has come for which all of us have been waiting, which is the address on art of judgment writing by Honorable Mr. Justice Surikan, Judge, Supreme Court of India. I pray to your Lordship to please take her to the podium. Justice Sunita Agrawal, Honorable Chief Justice of Gujarat High Court, my brother Justice Anjariya, Senior Most Judge of Gujarat High Court, my brother and sister judges of Gujarat High Court, Director of State Judicial Academy, officers of the High Court establishment, and my dear judicial officers. Thank you very much for the entire High Court and the District Judiciary that even before I 
could finish my program i have earned, already earned the gifts i'm sorry that uh, the program could start slightly late in the morning session probably it went uh, beyond our time expectation we were thinking that we will be able to start around 12:30 i'm extremely sorry for the delay we'll try to cover up uh, as much briefly as i can uh, share with you let me start with a caveat i am not an expert on judgment writing so don't think that uh, i'm going to share something very extraordinary which you people are not aware of anything i'm only discharging a duty and responsibility which how i took on myself i will share in a minute as a judge of the punjab and haryana high court i remained president of the state judicial academy for almost 4 years in 2014 i went for a 21 days training program to commonwealth judicial education institute at halifax in canada and like a student right from 9 am to 5:30 a pm i would attend the classes carrying my handbag with laptop and paper books and pen and pencils i will attend all the classes with a half an hour break during lunch time and that was a wonderful experience uh, the halifax institute at that time was headed by justice conor uh, the former judge of the canadian supreme court so every day in different sessions there would be some subject experts coming from different walks of life different parts of the globe and among those because i am coming directly on the point there came one dr raymond from new york and we were told in advance that he is an expert in judgment writing and he will let you know some skills and tools that how to write a good judgment well before that we were not aware that for what context and for what purpose the commonwealth judicial education institute had asked when even before i went there they asked me to send some of my judgments so as a judge you feel proud that yes i have authored so many judgments so by that time i had uh, written a few full bench judgments in the high court and some uh, important issues which i thought that those are really dealing with question of law or the constitutional issues so i sent all those judgments it so happened all the participants coming from different commonwealth countries they were staying in one there is a historical hotel there south feed hotel and i was also staying there like other judges from different countries and dr raymond when he came he incidentally stayed in the room which was adjoining to my one so he had gone through the judgments of all the judges who were participating including mine one in the morning when i got up i found a slip inside my room where dr remond had written justice kant you can improve your judgments so that was the first lesson i learned and on that day mind you he was to deliver that what the art of writing judgment so then we had a very long interactive session and some of the you know the thought processing i learned from him then i thought when i came back that i must repay to my academy after all i had gone on uh, government expenses and uh, public expenditure was spent on me so it was my duty to repay and when i came back then i tried to remold that program keeping in view the indian uh, you know requirements or need of our judiciary and this is how when occasionally i keep on uh, presenting that program and i normally sometimes i revise also to add something or to delete something so it is in this background that whatever i know little bit and i have tried to make it very interesting also so that it's not a burdensome kind of lecture i please take it i am not going to inflict a lecture on you it's only just uh, uh, i will try to make it uh, as interesting as it is possible and most of the things you know but then maybe that the uh, a, a new perspective i will try to give to you now let's go and very eloquently uh, chief justice sunita agrawal explained to you what are the contents of a judgment how what we expect from a judgment what should be the ingredients of a judgment now this what i have tried to say uh, i hope it's coming on the screen all right now the well judgment is of general import import and mean judicial determination of a court this is what you do when you deliver a judgment now this is my next line please we'll see very simply i have defined this determination by the court now the entire one line will probably try to explain the this determination by the court is the declaration of rights to be recognized and the remedies to be awarded to the parties upon facts found by the court or admitted by the parties 
in course of proceedings instituted for the redress of a legal injury now please tell me is there anything left out as far as the contents or ingredients of a judgment is concerned what really court does probably i have tried to define in this now the static definition of judgment as you find in cpc all of you are aware judgment means the statement given by the judge of the grounds of a decree or order but we don't have any definition in crpc crpc as you know only chapter 27 crpc prescribes various standards for the judgment including that it should be pronounced in open court that it should be a language of the court these are all in requirements not the contents and substance of the judgment now then you will all appreciate a statute in fact can never define that what should be a judgment and what is a judgment it's it is definitely uh, impossible because it's a human uh, uh, mind process writing judgment i will explain uh, further therefore it is necessary to identify the tools that may be relevant for writing a good judgment now what are those now please take it. now this is what i am trying to say judgment writing is more of an art rather than a science that is what the real mantra we need to understand like every art form it depends on the subjectivity and individual style of the creator the children the great children they have painted certain uh, you know uh, they have prepared some paintings and today uh, uh, your uh, uh, visionary committee and uh, the judicial academy they have uh, of course uh, now further given a further uh, a, a very uh, nice immemorable status to those paintings by putting it as a coffee table now this is all art what the children have painted is completely an art so is the writing of a judgment therefore i have said the judgment the it depends on the subjectivity and individual style of the creator the judge in the present case however despite of the subjectivity in judgment writing there are well recognized objective standards that must be followed to make a judgment achieve its purpose so the writing judge, the uh, the judge as a human being is your subjectivity but then while delivering the judgment while preparing the judgment with your subjectivity there are some objective standards which will have to be incorporated and taken care while writing a judgment the judgment writing is akin to fiction writing please now believe that and that i am going to explain that is what i everywhere i really put emphasis on it the narrative of judgment should keep the reader engaged and eager to know what comes in the judgment all of you as young students college students school students and even later part of the life we have been reading fictions novel hindi gujarati english and particularly those the thrillers and when you start reading you get anxiety that on next page what is there what's going to happen this character will survive or die this character will disappear or appear this character will again come or not that kind of anxiety that novel or thriller or fiction will keep on creating the judgment should also be like that the narrative of your facts narrative of the events should be like that that it gives a shape of a fiction and whosoever is reading he gets an interest that let's read the next paragraph what happens there after so that creation of human interest is a very important component of a good quality judgment writing so that's why i said judgment writing is akin to fiction writing similar to fiction the narrative of the judgment should keep the reader engaged and eager to know what comes next in the judgment the factual narration in the judgment should be so interesting that even a person who does not belong to the field of law can understand it and compare you with a professional storyteller i am using the word professional storyteller in childhood our grandparents our dadi ma everybody they used to be the storytellers and what we will do we will keep on asking them aage kya hua next what happened that is what a judgment should try to say that like a professional storyteller the you create that anxiety anxiousness in the mind of the reader of the judgment and what that reader is i will just further explain Now 
before I come uh, uh, to uh, the the ideas which I want to unconventional idea rather I will say unconventional ideas which I want to share. I think Chief Justice has very well explained to you that uh, the basic ingredients of the judgment as we understand. I only refer to these two three judgments by Supreme Court. You know it very well. I need not to read. I need not to even cite those. Union of India versus Jayaprakash 2007 Supreme Court gave the uh, what are the uh, real uh, kind of ingredients or expectations from a, a judicial officer, a judge while writing reasons introduce clarity in order, failure to give reasons will amount to denial of justice. All these broad principles, legal principles you will find well settled principles laid down. Then another rationale of a reasoned order is that the affected party can know why uh, should know why the decision has gone against him. That's what one of the, you know it very well and the learned, the officers with district judiciary will also in due course of time will appreciate. But at one point of time in high court also we used to pass the order, bail granted, bail dismissed. That was the stand. In high courts we used to do it, but ultimately then Supreme Court said, no, no you can't do it. Because your orders are appealable before us. So we would like to know, we, have, we need to have the advantage of what went uh, in your mind. What was the application of mind? Why did you grant and why did you decline? And therefore the reasons came as a sine qua non for passing an order. So now uh, in high court also long back we changed that stand. Then in, again in uh, that Saheli leasing Supreme Court 2010 laid down certain principle. Nothing should be written in the judgment which may not be germane to the facts of the case. Irrelevant things should not be mentioned in the judgment. The ratio decenda should be clearly spelt out. After preparing the uh, draft judgment, you must go through it so that uh, no facts should be missing, no principle, no argument should not also be missing. And everything, whatever has been argued by both the sides is taken care. That, that these are all basic things. The ultimate finished judgment should have the sustained chronology. Every event should be mentioned in a chronological manner. Citation, not so many citations. What is happening is that sometimes, and with res great respect, it's not that you only commit this mistake. Even in Supreme Court we do it, in High Court also we do it. We keep on citing one judgment, other, uh, the, uh, in this judgment it was held, then again it was held, then again it was held. How it can be substituted, I will just explain in the next part. So this is how the Supreme Court in certain judgments has laid down the principles of uh, uh, what should be the uh, ideal components of a judgment. Uh, then I refer to 2012. So I have only cited three judgments, 2007, 2010 and 2012. I know and you know, Supreme Court again in 2021 and in 2022 also has talked about the, what should be really the ideal contents of a judgment, but I am not referring to, again I am not burdening uh, the event with that. Now, the structure of legal analysis in a judgment, uh, please that something which will require consideration. Overview of relevant facts succinct statement of issues, position of parties on each issue and composite narrative, fact narrative which is directly relevant for taking the final view. So this is very very important. You must have the given the narrative of the facts on the basis of which you want to take the final view. So for example, in a given case, suppose you want to uphold a will in a civil suit. Ultimately, who was the executor, in whose favor, who were the witnesses, all these facts will have to be there. Who were the witnesses, how it was proved, was it registered or unregistered, was it the first or the last will, was he in a state of mind or not, was, is it shrouded by suspicious circumstances, all these relevant issues and facts based upon the evidence led before you, oral or documentary, you will have to refer to, ultimately to reach that conclusion that whether will is good or bad. Now, evidence on material facts, this is what I pointed out, relevant, relevance, reference to law, rules, regulations and relevant factor on which you are inclined to rely upon the, in the judgment. That must be mentioned. Say, for example, you want to hold that a particular, uh, say, let's take a woman that under so and so provision, she has got, got a right, so irrespective of a bill, her statutory right will remain intact. Now, which statutory right? Under which law? So unless you will refer to that provision, and that provision, for example, in a given case, suppose that provision came in 2010, and you want to uphold that right, say, in 75, 
then you will have to further discuss that this provision has come into with retrospective effect or it, whether it is expressly uh, 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 retrospective or it is impliedly uh, pro, uh, uh, retrospective. All these things which ultimately culminate into a final decision by you, that sequence of events, including facts and legal position and statutory provisions, rules and regulation must be complete. Hence for being coherent, it is important for the judgment to have a structure. Now, what is that structure, please? This is, I have called it as FIRAQ. What is that? Facts, issue, rules, analysis, and conclusion. So the FIRAQ formula is something which should be in your pocket, that I have to follow this FIRAQ. So facts, issues, rules, analysis, and conclusion. Once you do that, probably you will not be missing anything. Now, what do we mean by facts? Again, because this is again, uh, uh, sometimes we get confused that sometimes maybe that you are required to mix up the question, uh, the facts and maybe a, a provision of a law or some, in a given case, some government guidelines, instructions, or maybe some old documents, some revenue record or something. Is it, will it be a, a part of the facts or not? So what is identifying material facts is important because the ratio of the of a case is the material facts of the case plus the ruling of the court, ultimately what you will hold. Now six important questions will arise when you determine the facts. What? What? Is, what? The factual genesis of the dispute. So what is, what is really disputed before you? Maybe adoption of a child is disputed before you. The status of marriage is disputed before you. So what? The second is who? With whom? The, the dispute is between whom? So the parties involved and the allied facts relevant for the question of locust and die. The very, very important. Who are the parties before you? That's also very, very determinative. <coughs> Someone, third person, stranger, nothing to do with, he challenged the adoption. Who is he? What is his locus? And therefore, the who are the parties before you becomes very, very important. Where? The place of dispute. Suppose the will is executed in Delhi, the dispute arose in Delhi and somebody files in suit in Ahmedabad. Obviously, the place where all these facts have, the events have taken place, that becomes quite relevant. When? Again, for the purpose of limitation, this becomes. So these please, what, who, where, when? The timeline of dispute and approaching the court, which would be relevant for standpoint of the limitation law. And then comes why and how, which are more particular relevant in criminal cases for that's for motive, etc. But that's also why and how. That's again a very important factor which you need to keep in mind. Now, please see next facts that should be left out of for brevity. Now, when we I'm laying emphasis on facts and the relevancy of facts or sequence of facts, and when I'm insisting you that all should everything should be disclosed. Now, I'm also saying that for the sake of brevity certain facts, certain things should be immediately skipped. This is how you will make a judgment very comprehensive, composite, precise, and to the point. What you should do is details that are irrelevant to the outcome. Any detail, parties will keep on pleading anything in plaint, in written statement, in rejoinder, in the evidence, and all these things. But once you find that the issues before you are this one, and for determination of these issues, these are the relevant facts, facts which you have called out, rest of the facts which have no material bearing you must skip those facts otherwise those will keep on creating confusion and they, they will have some adverse impact on the quality of your judgment i, I will give you the formal findings that are not disputed suppose a fact is not disputed at all where is the need to repeat it time and again and where the once you know the as admitted fact some there is no dispute with regard to a person a child who was major or minor on a particular date if the other party in the written statement has admitted, where the need for you to determine an issue and to keep on repeating that fact, so that's not required. So all those facts which are admitted, not disputed, can be skipped. The next is, now, the uh, uh, time and again, we keep on referring to that, what are the really issues? How the issues we determine that those would arise for consideration. Now, one definition is Order 20, uh, Rule 5 CPC. I have reproduced that in court to state the decision on each issue. But what is the issue? The CPC also doesn't define that they only require mandates that you will determine each issue. That means you will decide every issue that arises for your consideration. 
However, this rule should generally be followed in all kind of cases. Advantages. When you determine the issues, advantage. What is the advantage? To ensure that every aspect is given due attention. Different issues may have different standards. Now, please, this is something you will not find in CPC, and that's experience based. I am sharing with you. Different issues may have different standards. What is that? An issue may be explicit. Something may be admitted. So on the on the face of it, the, nobody will dispute that a statute came into force on so and so date. That is an ex facie admitted fact. That is one issue. The other issue can be prima facie. The third can be preponderance of probability. The other can be beyond reasonable doubt. Demarcation ensures proper standard is met. So now each every issue when you deal with. There will be different yardsticks, there will be different parameters, there will be different kind of consideration before you. For a prima facie case for upholding your discussion, your reasoning will be altogether different as compared to very briefly noticing which is something ex facie on record. So therefore the standards will be different. And issues, obviously the process of determination of issues will also vary from ultimate, whether it is ex facie, prima facie or preponderance of probability. Now, material issues such as the following shall be laid out first. Normally, you people always do it also. Questions on expiry of limitation period, where the issue of limitation is disputed, obviously, you will always determine it. Jurisdiction of the court and locus standi of the parties. These three issues normally do arise, parties take objection, and ultimately, before we reach the final conclusion, we must obviously determine all these issues because those will determine ultimately that. Uh, somebody has even a right to even uh, come to the court or not. The issues shall be arranged in a logical chain where each issue is dependent on the other for its viability and analysis. If the issues on com are completely independent of each other, then we may arrange such issues chronologically. Now, these two things please appreciate again together. Sometimes the finding of on issue A is bound to have impact on issue B and C. Therefore, when you are deciding issue A, you will skip the findings on issue B. You will also skip the finding on issue C, but at the same time, you will complete issue A again following the principle of fiction writing at such a stage that immediately in your mind also in the mind of the reader and the parties and everyone comes that what is going to be there in issue number B. So therefore, issue B and C, you will put in such a manner that each issue depend on the other. One narrative is finished in A, second narrative will start with B. Once B is over, then you will come to the narrative of issue C. But sometimes A is altogether independent, B is also dependent, C is also dependent. Then in that case, you can take it chronologically. You need not to take up them in such a way that they are inter interdependent on each other. Question of law, question of facts should be in depth, uh, identified separately that you always do it. The analysis of each issue should be self-contained like stanza in a poem. Again, I'm taking you to the, uh, to the fiction world, to the writer's world, to the literary world. It should be like a stanza in a poem. I think you all are capable enough to understand what I'm trying and what I'm emphasizing. The statute and rules, sometimes in high court, of course, it comes more, but in lower courts also definitely when rights are based on the statutes, whether say, for example, uh, succession right, adoption right, marital rights, maintenance right, any type of land right, ownership rights, all these things based on statutes and rules. So you need to, the judgment should take, then mention the relevant statute rules that apply to the situation. Binding precedents must be followed, but how these will be followed, I will explain later on. In case there are more than one statute rule, the reasons to follow one set of statute rule and also the reason not to follow the other should be assigned. This is very, very important part of the judgment. Say, for example, somebody may say that I am entitled to maintenance under 125 CRPC. The other party may take objection. No, the parties are going by XYZ uh, 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 law. And therefore, whatever right will accrue under that. And eventually, suppose you decide to follow XYZ law. Then you will say, I am following XYZ law and for these reasons. And since I am following XYZ, therefore, 125 CR will, CRPC will not be applicable. And then you will say that that provision, therefore, I hold is not attractive to this case. 
So all these two findings are very, very important. If you are silent on one, the parties may get an impression as if there are rights available under XYZ also and under 125 also. The party may get this wrong impression that in fact my right was under 125, but the judge has not dealt with it. So one line by you that 125 is not applicable becomes equally important and as important as you hold that XYZ is applicable. So this is what uh, I, I feel that it's, our judgment should contain that. Now the next issue is the, I believe conclusion of, uh, conclusion of judgment. Conclusion should play a different role than a mere summary. Now please understand this line. While summary is the concise view of all the points, the conclusion binds all the arguments together and states the final outcome of the case. So the conclusion should not be mixed up with the summary of findings. Conclusion has nothing to do with summary of findings. Conclusion is an ultimate final outcome of those findings. So the conclusion must draw a distinct, independent and separate place in your judgment away from the findings which you have already arrived at while deciding different issues. Brevity is essential in conclusion. Otherwise, what will happen? Conclusion exceeding one page is likely to seem like a new argument. When your conclusion itself is running into pages, any reader, any layman, any lawyer, any litigant, any stakeholder will think that a new argument, a new point has been introduced at this stage. So the conclusion must be crisp, final to the point without referring to the findings. Review the entire judgment once it is complete. That's uh, all of, most of you do. Now, please, now these are certain two, three, four things which are really I want to share with you. Language of the judgment. The language should be as simple as possible. There are people who think that I will pick up dictionary, will find out some very hard and harsh words I am use, rather I use them. And you force the other party also to open a dictionary and to understand what is the meaning of this word. Why do I use it? That should not be the why write plain English, which enables the parties to understand the contents and subjects. You should read your draft from the perspective of a person. Now, please see this line. You should read your draft from the perspective of a person who has no legal background and circles those words and phrases which could not be understand. The words which you can't understand, how do you expect the others to understand? If you are forced to open a dictionary to understand the meaning, what kind of injury you are inflicting on the other? You are torturing the others. So please avoid that. So first, the, the parameter should be, the benchmark should be, if I don't open a dictionary, if I don't take assistance of anything, am I able to understand the word? And am I able to understand the true meaning of the word? Sometimes a generalized word can be there. But do I appreciate and understand that in the context of the factual scenario of this case, the word which I have chosen, does it convey the accurate and exact meaning which I want to convey? So therefore, the simple language will always be the ideal one to convey all these things. Concentrate on punctuation and grammar as they are invisible elements of art of judgment writing. That's very, very important. Simple punctuation. Sometimes commas are added. Those create, you know it, there, there are a lot of interpretation by Supreme Court even of commas. So let's avoid that kind of thing with people writing 20, 30, 50 pages on that. What is the meaning of a comma in a statute? Those things can be avoided with a simple language. How can you avoid? Again, I'm going to explain by writing very short sentences. Then you don't need comma. Then you don't need semicolon. Then you don't need brackets. You write a very simple short sentence. Use the next sentence. Full stop, next sentence. Then everything will be solved. Since one of the important stakeholders with the judgment are also the parties, Brevity and simplicity is the key. I think all of you will in, in, in informally and out of this auditorium, when I'm standing with you, each one of you will agree with me that parties are not interested in the judgment. They are only interested in the last part. relief dismiss kiya allow kiya hai. Who bothers about the judgment? Judgment only becomes a subject matter when it is particularly in your ca cases because most of the judgments are appealable judgments. 
the problem is only uh, why this all duty responsibility comes on you because the next court wants to have the advantage of application of mind at your level they want to know the reasons which really persuade you to come to a particular conclusion and this is how that part of judicial review whether those reasons are correct or incorrect that ultimately right mind you if there is one super supreme court 50 percent of our judgment will also be set aside that i'm quite sure it's only because we are the final one so thank god that we don't have that kind of problem otherwise that may arise so it's not that your judgment sometimes reasons are not accepted judgment is reversed. that's part of the judicial functioning that we should not bother but a reason should also be there and as i said the judgment should be with brevity and simplicity so that parties are able to understand it now language of the judgment one is the uh, english part i said reasoning should be very logical coherent and systematically organized it should look like that as i said fiction writing uh, writing a poem writing something where a, you one can keep on you know it it arouse the interest and you keep on reading it sentencing in the uh, sentences in the judgment should not be very long and complicated now please see that's what i wanted to convey sentence should be very simple and i am going to give you some example very interesting example you will find avoid uh, prefer the active voice the negative voice uh, please take it out don't use negative language in this judgment use always positive and passive uh, the uh, uh, the active voice avoid double triple negatives now look at the instance i am giving for you now please read with me for instance avoid like this it cannot be said that i do not disagree with parties why should we say like this i don't agree with the parties or i agree with the parties it can be very simple it can be said paraphrase large paragraphs and avoid block quotations this part is what i want to convey you and if you will follow it I, I i can promise you you will start enjoying writing your judgment these two three things prefer active voice avoid double triple negatives paraphrase large paragraphs and avoid block quotations avoid emotionally charged language this is extremely important if you are swayed by the facts and reasons we all are human being we we are some many a times be you dictate first time judgment you feel when second time maybe third time thought processing then we start thinking nahi aisa karenge to dusri party ko harm ho jayega isn't it aisa mind mein aata hai aise hum kisi ka nuksan kar denge jo hamare paas nahi hai invisible victims of a judgment this what the term i have used invisible victims of a judgment who are the invisible victims when we are deciding dispute between a and b and we start lecturing on an issue which ultimately affect c who is not party before us so he becomes a victim of unnecessarily our judgment delivery process so that can be avoided by preventing the uh, insertion of an emotionally charged language don't add separate sentences uh, with commas this is what exactly i was saying one sentence then comma then another sentence instead put the full stop instead of comma you have available put, full stop is also there in english grammar so use the full stop instead of comma write another sentence don't add separate sentence and commas use definite specific concrete language your language should be straight to the point this party has got a right of so and so so and so nothing else why should that therefore it in all probabilities every there is every likelihood that this party has got a right under so and so provision instead of that you straight away say yes this is the right you are entitled to or you are not entitled to a specific blunt conclusion do not overstate now please see the line which i am putting in inverted commas don't overstate if something goes without saying let it go unsaid i hope you understood it's not necessary many times we keep on writing something which is not necessary let it go unsaid avoid such verbs which might create doubt on the facts quoted for example avoid the verb to be if it can be replaced by a specific verb such as was or had been i think that that will take care of sometimes uncertainty which we create now see the examples of 
what a beautiful language this Lord Denning has used. I, these are only samples which I am putting before you. I am, I am giving one or one, one, two more samples. Look at Lord Denning, and we are talking of a plain, simple English in the context of Indian consumer of justice. Many of them are illiterate. Most of them, huge amount of them are semi-literate. Ruralite, our even law graves, lawyers are also not well conversant. Their people have their own social economic disadvantages. We are talking of the consumer of justice of that society and see how Lord Denning dealt with. It is a case of beautiful, uh, just one paragraph I will read. It happened on April 19, 1964, full stop. It was blue bell time in Kent. Look at the sentences. Mr. and Mrs. Hinge had been married some 10 years. No date, no time. Look at the next line. And they had four children, all is nine and under. Because just dining knew nothing is depending upon the age of the children. So he only wanted to tell the elder one because ultimate quantum of compensation that the family will be entitled to. So nine and under. The youngest was one. Mrs. Hinge was a remarkable woman. In addition to her own four, she was foster mother of four other children. To add to it, she was also two months pregnant with her fifth child. Then unfortunately an accident took place. She lost her husband and how the compensation is awarded. This is the classical example of using the simplest form of English in shortest possible sentences. I am giving you another Indian example. Justice Vivian Bose. A very profound jurist of uh, Indian Supreme Court, Justice Vivian Bose. Look at a very in, uh, famous judgment of the Indian Supreme Court, Anwar Ali Sarkar. Look at the language. Then again, what does equality mean? Equality mean? Question mark. All men are not alike. Look at one sentence, four words. Some are rich and some are poor. Some by the mere accident of birth inherit riches. Others are born to poverty. I mean, you can't really expect more than this a simple language he has used. There are differences in social standing and economic status. Full stop. High sounding phrases cannot alter such fundamental facts. In one line, Article 14's philosophy has been culled down. In one sentence, high sounding phrases cannot alter such fundamental facts. It is therefore impossible to apply rules of abstract equality to conditions which predicate inequality from the start. These are only few examples I have tried to give. Let me give you the reverse example also. All of you have read under the Indian Contract Act, Lord Diplock. Many judgments are cited because he was an expert on this subject. But look at his paragraph. This is a negative reverse example I am giving you. That was the, it's a very famous judgment, free men and uh, uh, locker. He says, an apparent or ostensible authority is a legal relationship between the principal and the contractor created by a representation, comma, made by the principal to the contractor, again, comma, intended to be and in fact acted upon by the contractor, again, comma, then that the agent has authority to enter on behalf of principal into a contract of a kind within the scope of the apparent authority, again comma, so as to render the principal liable to perform any obligations imposed upon him by such contract. But ultimately what Lord Diplock wants to say, I have tried to, I have tried to do that homework. Please read the next line. If instead of that, if Lord Diplock had written, a person is not liable for the acts of another person, Unless he, she himself holds, holds out that she, he, she is so bound. In doing so, he, she is said to grant apparent ostensible authority. That is what probably just the Lord Diplock wanted to convey. And maybe, maybe anyone of, uh, better uh, with a better language will be able to simplify it more. But this is how we can probably avoid these long sentences, comma after comma and adding one sentence after the other. What should a judgment avoid for brevity? After giving these two, three examples, I have tried to say redundant synonymous of words 
for instead of saying null and void why can't we say void what is there what we will lose in a judgment suppose we don't say null or if we say simple void i don't think that your judgment will be set aside on that ground you can say dates and details on which nothing turns and which do not influence the ruling please mind it please consider it dates and details on which nothing turns and which do not influence the ruling in a suit for succession suppose somebody says my the plaintiff says uh, my father or his elder brother they were born before the hindu succession act came into force on so and so date they were major this and that and in your judgment you are referred to and suppose in one statement somewhere it is mentioned one of them was 83 year old and you repeat it in judgment where is the need of that it is good enough that they were major on the date when the act whether it was 73 or 83 or 53 is com com completely irrelevant so the dates or details on which nothing turns and which do not influence the ruling those can be avoided to for the sake of brevity repetition of facts once we have set out the facts at one place and in some paragraphs and chronologically as i said there is no need to repeat them and even if there is a need suppose a lengthy judgment and you want to refresh and remind the reader then you can say in view of the facts noted from paragraph say 7 to 19 this and that so mean instead of repeating those facts here words and overlapping meaning in a sentence instead of saying on appeal appellant argues that normally we do it why can't we say the appellant argues that that's very simple meanings of the the other part this this uh, part is of course based upon the supreme court's uh, uh, we have uh, really uh, uh, conveyed a message to the indian judiciary about the sensitivity and fairness in judgment and that uh, you will find there is a handbook now released by the supreme court it's available on the supreme court website also and i think in all the high courts also it has been received and most of i think you must have been conveyed also in any case uh, it must have been gone and uh, i can request the judicial academy to hold certain sessions about that the judgment should use such a language that is sensitive to all sections and inspire public confidence just must not ask the woman question those then the words and that booklet gives a complete i need not to detain you for that purpose because you have already a ready-made material sent by the supreme court those everything is available in that and uh, i'm quite sure that you people are already uh, conscious enough and uh, you are uh, very well informed uh, class of citizens and part of the judicial system that you are aware of all these things the objectivity of a judgment we should always keep in mind never now please see two three things why objectivity is very important when i talked about earlier subjectivity that subjectivity of a judge but following the objective standards now what is the objectivity in judgment never did two men make the same judgment of the same thing i have quoted one very famous uh, michael day i have quoted uh, in his from his essay of experience never did two men make the same judgment of the same thing and that is the beauty of the judges uh, there is nothing wrong in it because this is how that uh, then when he said i uh, when i said the human mind application of human mind that is what it happens when say what does it mean to have a judgment that is objective if judgments were to be objective now please see if the judgments were to be objective why would different judges reach different conclusion for the same question of law and it happens every day many a times in supreme court in fact we request different high courts that you please take up there are say for example wires of a statute are challenged one high court takes the view that it is ultra virus it violates so and so provision the other high court say no there is nothing ultra virus it, it's within the framework of the constitution it can be upheld the other high court will say partly it is ultra virus partly it is uh, okay it's fine and we normally we say in supreme court we would like to have the advantage of the wisdom of the different high courts because that will you know uh, not only help us but it will en enrich and enhance our knowledge also that how the thought processing is going on in different parts of the uh, uh, country about one a particular provision of law so one question different judges will reach different conclusion for the same question of law i quoted another author he says very interesting line legal interpretation is an intersection of objectivity and subjectivity 
intersection of objectivity and subjectivity where after following the same objective rules of adjudication judges can reach their different subjective outcomes so same set and different conclusions hence what objectivity requires is following the established norms of say purposive interpretation such as understanding the legislative history paying attention to the text of the statute and what subjectivity allows is one's own conclusion after following these norms this entails two aspects one that the judgment should be fair and should not be biased and second it should follow the due procedure of law that is the ultimate uh, when i cited three judgments those are also will culminate into the same uh, conclusion while being in the chair of a judge we all must detach ourselves from our ideologies and approach the case in a non partition way further statutory procedure must be followed while procedure has been held to be handmade of justice violating the procedure flagrantly also leads to unjust conclusion this is all the more true in criminal cases where say achieving truth and securing right of the parties require the court to follow the procedure prescribed by the statute these are general guidelines my closing remarks are remember judgment right thing again i am saying is an art that requires the delicate weaving of legal expertise with eloquence precision and fairness the judge must ensure that the structure is proper and coherent the language must be simple and equitable to all sections of the society the judgment must not create any doubts regarding biasness and must follow due procedure of law whatever i had discussed earlier probably i have try to uh summarize in uh, these uh, two three uh, lines uh, i hope i have been able to convey what i uh, meant and what i really wanted to say to you my idea was only write very simple plain language but legally sound legally correct based upon your objective and unbiased understanding of the provision of the law to be applied in the context of the set of facts which are before you and therefore sometimes applicability of law not only sometimes it always vary from case to case the facts are always different and each set of facts will invite a different kind of applicability and extent of applicability all these factors once we keep in mind i think the quality of judgment will improve and that will enhance the faith trust and confidence of the stakeholders particularly the consumer of justice the litigants because we will write not for lawyers we will not write for jurists we will not write for legal academicians who will write who will keep on writing articles on our judgments no we will write for that common man who is waiting for us to find out what happened to his case thank you very much thank you for giving this time thank you jai thank you my lord for very pertinent insights in the art of judgment writing and the greed in me just forces me to say that we must take full advantage of his lordship's presence here and therefore if any of you has any questions or any points for interaction they may please be addressed articulated so that his lordship can have or we can have his lordship's comment on the same mics may be circulated anybody who has a point to make please uh, raise their hand so that we can pass you the mic Okay. 
if you not ask any question then i will uh, leave the place with two presumptions one that i have whatever i have spoken you have not understood <laughs> second whatever i have spoken is so useless and irrelevant that you don't want to uh, really uh, uh, keep it stored in your mind but this on lighter side you can ask any question don't feel hesitant don't feel shy about that See, what i can can understand what justice surikant was trying to tell you that you can freely ask your doubts you are not supposed to be intimidated by all of us <laughs> this is what he was trying to say please with, ask the, there must be doubts i understand with my lord's permission my lord uh, of course very humbly i am putting it up that whenever it comes to drawing of judgment of subordinate judiciary please, please adjust your right? mic like G -G this G -G please adjust G -G your mic G -G like this okay. uh, my lord uh, i am very sorry and i am humbly putting up that difference that whenever it comes to the judgments of subordinate judiciary my lord we'll have to go in the facts now whenever we go into the facts we can ignore the material fact but according to evidence act we'll have to go to two things number one fact in issue and relevant facts and on the basis thereof we are drawing the conclusion now for that purpose my lord will have to you know uh, put up lot of mass of facts for that purpose so to that extent there is a difference between this you know two sets of judgments please my lord may you know put some light on that i know i think uh, probably uh, uh, let me again reemphasize it i use the word material facts that material facts you will refer to and i think when you go by the uh, definition evidence act that's Jee. why i have chosen the word material uh, all those facts are relevant and uh, will constitute the material facts and material facts definitely will refer to because without that you will not be able to reach uh, that's i uh, i probably uh, try to convey you that when you uh, will frame the formulate the issues and you will discuss on issue wise then all the material facts you will refer to irrelevant facts i said right. where nothing depends upon those facts i use the probably the term nothing depends on those facts yeah. those facts you can skip okay my lord a counter to this even one more question is there because we are always bound by that definition of proof which says that after considering material before it then definition operates in two parts first part says that it is the belief whatever belief is induced by the fact in issue or a material or a relevant fact and on the basis thereof judge may draw the conclusion second part says that judiciary will have to apply the standard of a prudent man now when we are going on this two aspect at that time too my lord will have to look at third factor now what is the third factor because in definition the legislature has used word facts material facts before the court now in material two things are there my lord either it may be fact in issue it may be relevant fact and my lord your article could be there so my lord on that fact my lord may throw some light well i think i i i, I will not say uh, uh, i will not add anything i will leave to you <laughs> <laughs> the point is very simple why should i carry your burden with me that's actually an art and uh, actually whatever you said created so much of confusion that we were <laughs> all in a fix nothing to answer but if the, this is what i uh, understand i if i can speak on uh, to add what uh, justice uh, honorable justice surikant has said that you have to have clarity in your thought your thought the creativity 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 comes with clarity so if you are, you have clarity in your thought that what are the issues and what are the material facts and what are the issues which you can leave open uh, leave 
apart, not open, leave apart. And then what is to be applied and what is the ratio? Then that confusion which you are creating that the definition says so and it says so, that will not be there at all. Because whatever is, it, it is clear, facts, law, evidence, law, and then conclusion. So nothing to be confused about it. Only one small addition uh, which I, uh, in my uh, PowerPoint I didn't add. Uh, there is one uh, principle of FOPP also. Uh, I thought that I will keep this next time and maybe in second slide when I will prepare, I will add to that. The facts of the opposite party. That you should always be careful. When you, after reading the brief, entire everything when you have read and you have made up your mind that this is a case which deserves to be dismissed or this is a case which deserves to be allowed or decreed, obviously you have made up your mind to decide against one party. Principle of FOPP is a part of fairness. Then you must deal with the case of the party against whom you are deciding in from every angle, whatever the has been pleaded and whatever is being argued before you, you must in all fairness deal with that. And in my uh, uh, the next uh, PowerPoint, which I'm, I have almost prepared it, I'm going to say, write and write with such reasoning as if you are the counsel for that party, as if you are the advocate of that party, you write for that, but then you defeat yourself, you, re you reject that reasoning. That also will bring, uh, you know, that will enhance the credibility of the judgment. After this lively introduction, it's time to offer very special thanks to Honorable Mr. Justice Surya Khan Saab, and of course, all of those who have contributed to this event. May I request Honorable Mr. Justice N. V. Anjaria, Senior Most Judge, High Court of Gujarat, and Executive Chairman, Gujarat State Legal Services Authority, to please take the podium to offer a vote of thanks. About what of things, what of thanks, there are three things. First, it is time to conclude. Secondly, nobody listens to it, <laughs> mainly the audience. And thirdly, it is perceived to be an exercise which is a sheer formality. But let this vote of thanks be a genuine exception. The reason being, it is extended by me, of course, but on behalf of all of you and on behalf of the High Court. My Lord Justice Surekant, Judge Supreme Court of India, we stand overwhelmed because of your presence in accepting the invitation. <clears throat> I can say with sense of guarantee that the informative, analytical and elaborate discourse on the right of art, right art of heretic judgment you delivered has been listened with great attention by all of us. And the tips which are given will be carried by all of us, not why in Gujarat, everywhere in the country, to their logical end. Sir, we know that your time is very valuable. Still you have come here, spared it, spent it for us. We are indeed grateful. The presence of my Lord has provided a globe, globe shining to the entire event. I also thank the Chief Justice of the Gujarat High Court, Ladyship Sunita Agrawal, whose dynamic, decisive and dedicated leadership has always been a guiding spirit to culminate everything, including this function, to a great success. The second October uh, creative workshop organized for the staff of the High Court, the children drawing workshop, at the genesis of, genesis in the creative idea of holding such workshop, 
by my Lord, the Chief Justice. It has now been many... <laughs> the workshop has now stands manifested in the stroke, the book, just the coffee table book just released at the August end of my Lord, the, 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 the just, my Lord, my Lord Surekant. I take opportunity to thank Brother Justice Amiable Biren Vaishnav, Sister Justices esteemed Sangeeta Ben Vishen and Geeta Gopi, who are the members of the Juvenile Justice Committee of the High Court, who have taken a painstaking efforts in what we are witnessing. Thank you so much. Innocence personified is our dear Hina, Hina Jayesh Bagela. She came here on the dais. It was an event which was a value addition to this function. We are grateful to all of them. Thanks to my all sister and brother judges, not for remaining present in this program, but for showing a necessary involvement in the event. Thanks for thanks to Registrar General for masterly monitoring the things. Sri Odedra, Director of Judicial Academy, State Judicial Academy, for efficiently organizing the program. Sri Rahul Trivedi, the member secretary of the Gujarat State Legal Services Authority, who always sails his boat safe and sure. Not to forget Mr. Ukrani for his meticulous live streaming and the IT arrangements. Sri Vitlani, our assistant registrar, also the PWD staff, those who have decorated the munch. It is all these flowers, visible and non-visible, which have lended fragrance to this program and a sense of fulfillment. Thank you very much. Now may I request all of you to please stand at your place for national anthem. Save the Honorable Lordships and members of the Registry, all of the other esteemed guests may please proceed for lunch on the second floor, please. Or should we have a